So, sorry, as I start. So we're looking at sort of debunking the complexity of running based high intensity interval training and sort of talk about its practical applications throughout tonight's talk. As mentioned, it is a topic I've had focus on very, pretty much closely um, for a whole year during honours. Additionally, I am strength and conditioning coach down at Kingston City. Um, started this year, unfortunately, season's ended, but I'm still helping out the players on the side with programming and stuff like that. And then the logo at the bottom is just a concept for the time being. It's something I'm going to be adapting in the near future. But for now, it's a concept. So yeah, okay, at the moment there is a salt shaker on the screen. Um, but I just want to preface the pre presentation with the saying, take any, everything I say with a grain of salt. Whether you take something minor or major from this and you use it within your own practice, or don't use anything at all, it's completely fine. It's just something I'm a bit passionate about. So it, as I said, it's something I've, I've been presenting on, which I worked full time for a whole year. So I would also say I'm not an expert on the topic, but I can sort of direct, direct you to the right resources if you want to learn more about this topic. But I am just ex um, sharing my understanding of what I have explored and actually tested. Cool. So we're just going to couple of definitions just before we get into the actual depth of the talk. So HIT or high intensity interval training, I'm going to be referring to that as repeated intervals of high intensity exercise, typically above the lactate threshold that is interspersed with periods of low intensity exercise or passive recovery. HIT types refers to the relative engagement or either the cardio metabolic being the aerobic and anaerobic and all the neuromuscular systems. And then the HIIT methods are the different variations of HIIT training or HIIT sessions that can be manipulated to target the HIIT types. So it works like a bit of a flowing chain, how everything links up together towards the end. So with those definitions out of the way, I think we can get into it. So within HIIT training, we can see on the screen now, it's sort of broken up into a number of different intervals, nine to be exact. But with this, it has a massive amount of manipulation that you can do, whether you just manipulate one variable or all nine somehow. And with these manipulations, it actually affects the acute physiological responses from the session. So it can be simple or complex with the way you want to go about it. And with the nine uh, variables within any given session, you've got work interval um, intensity and duration, rest interval intensity duration, between series recovery intensity and duration, the series duration itself, so, and the actual total volume. So there's quite a lot to sort of have a think about before even looking at one session. Usually when we go about this, we usually, and I think the common variable everyone sort of manipulates is work interval duration and intensity and the rest interval as well. So for example, we always look at using a 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off, a 30, 20, a 20, 40, Something like that. And then we always use something similar to passive recovery is usually a common one or walking as a low intensity exercise. So within this, the manipulation of any given variable will determine both the responses and adaptations to the hit sessions, acute and chronically. So whether it be straight away a week later, or would be three blocks down. The more variables we begin to manipulate, the more complex the session becomes. And the same with the responses and adaptations. So at some time, if we want to manipulate four or more, it can become a double-edged double -edged sword. So you want to be particularly careful with the way you approach or the way you want to program a six-week block as an example. 
you don't want to go too into depth with it. You want to work it and break it down first. Cool. So let's talk about characterizing the actual responses to hit the hit types. So given the very influence of hit variable manipulation on the acute responses, as I mentioned, hit prescription can become complicated when programming it in any given training phase. Usually the general rules that guide hit prescription are the sessions acute, cardiometabolic and neuromuscular responses, the associated cellular signaling that will target long-term adaptation, the accum accumulated training load from other sessions, as in skill-based or technical training sessions or resistance training sessions, the time needed to recover, and the impact on the ability to perform subsequent sessions. So if you do this in the morning, how will this impact, impact your training at night time, as an example? So to, to help guide this, hit types are classified based on the relative engagement of the cardiometabolic and neuromuscular demands. As you can sort of see on the screen, hit type one is sort of determined or predominantly aerobic, which is pretty much just, just demands from um, the cardiorespiratory and oxidative muscle, muscle fibers. Hit type two is aerobic, same as hit type one, but with a degree of neuromuscular strain. Hit type three is aerobic, but with a substantial anaerobic glycolytic contribution. Hit type four is the same as hit type three, but with a degree of neuromuscular strain. And then hit type five is purely anaerobic with neuromuscular strain. So having the sort of hit types, it gives us a bit of a clearer picture of what we want from the session or the session's outcomes. Um, sorry. Yeah, I think, yeah, Jared, I think everyone's in. Oh, yeah, there it is. It's popped in. Cool. All right. Sweet. So, as we've had that clearer picture now presented, we can sort of look at how do we want to approach the training for a given week or a given session? Do you want to target a hit type five at the start, seeing as it's probably neuromuscular demanding, or do you want to do hit type two or hit type four as they're the main hit types that target neuromuscular? And obviously from those sessions, there will be fatigue or higher fatigue compared to a hit type one, three from those. So it's how you want to approach this as well. So this is where the hit methods, formats, or weapons, they've got completely different names come into sort of a consideration. From a practical perspective, hit sessions can be implemented using a variety of different methods defined by the manipulation of the variables, once again. Um, primarily the duration and therefore the intensity of work and rest intervals are usually the ones you want to target the most. So as an example, hit sessions can involve anything between repeated short, as in less than 60, 60 seconds, to long, two to four minutes, bouts of rather high, not maximal intensity exercise. These are ter termed short and long interval hit. Short interval hit being less than 60 seconds of work, whereas long interval hit being that two to four minutes. Or hit can actually be used in less than 10 seconds, repeated speed sprint sequences, or longer sprint sequences that are greater than 20 seconds. These are known as RST, so repeated sprint training, or SIT, sprint interval training. And you can sort of see on the left, everything sort of within there and sort of within the hit format there. 
The prescription variables within each hit method can further be adjusted to modify the acute physiological response. And more importantly, each hit method can be modified to target several different hit types. So a bit of an example, hit type, hit or hit short interval with its right manipulation can target both, actually, sorry, not both, but hit types one to four. So hit short interval can actually target a good majority of hit types, just depending on how you manipulate the variables. Hit long interval will target hit type three and four. Uh, repeated, repeated sprint training will target hit type three and four. And then sprint interval training will target hit type five. So you can see how hit short has the biggest variance with targeting the hit types, whereas sprint interval training can only target essentially one hit type. So it adds a little bit of more depth and you can sort of see with the flow chart I've got on the right side. If you pick your target first, you can then pick your method. By having those two pretty much hand in hand, you can then look at the variables to see what, to, what needs to be adjusted in order to get that final structured session. So if you want to pick a hit type three, as an example, hit type three is aerobic with anaerobic. Uh, what weapon can you choose? You could essentially choose a hit long interval or repeated sprint training, depending on how you manipulate the variables. So that's when it becomes a little bit easier once you get an understanding of the hit types, the hit weapons, and the variables that you can actually adjust. So as I said at the start, it's something definitely that flows down each other. Once one works, you'll find something else, find something else, and it'll link together for that final session, without a doubt. So there's no stress in having to adjust last minute if you've properly pre-planned it or looked at the sessions without any hesitation. So putting all the puzzle pieces together. So we've got the hit variables, the hit types and the hit methods. You can count those as puzzle pieces. So how do we complete the puzzle within a given training week or given session? As I previously mentioned, you can have, you can start at hit type and then go into hit method and then go into the variables. But it's kind of clear that a lot of things have to be taken into consideration when prescribing hit. So you can see actually on the slide now that one of the example is using last match play. And that can be sort of a way to prescribe hit, uh, hit sessions. When did they last play? And then you can sort of see it flows down. When's the next match? Have they got five days? Have they got less than five days? Was the last match played less than 35 minutes ago? When's the next match? Two days, three to four, five days. So with this example on the screen now, it sort of takes into effect affect the the fatigue that comes across when um, athletes have actually played the game. So with this, you can see a bit further into depth what hit weapon is going to be used and the actual variable manipulation. So you got hit short a couple of times. A lot of times actually. And then you've got sprints, you've got small-sided games, which is more technical and technique-based. But you can sort of see how this flowchart really works depending on what they want to start with, which is last, last played match. So with this, we can actually break down the, the weekly structure into two categories, one being simple and then the other one being complex. Simple just refers to keeping the session very basic, 
only manipulating one to two variables such as work into such as work intensity duration or the rest and where these sessions would sit concurrently with training both skill and resistance so by having a simple sort of understanding of programming and simple hit programming it can easily link in together with other training your athlete has to do whether that be through in the weight room or on the field on the pitch or even during games so as an example programming sprint interval training which targets hit type 5 which is just to clarify clarify again is anaerobic and neuromuscular would be it would be more beneficial at the, towards the start of the week as it is presumed that with the combination of both the systems it would be more fatiguing for a lot of the athletes and it's a bit more and logically you definitely want to complete high speed work as well if you're working with an athlete who's in team sports so doing that at the start of the week is probably more beneficial for yourself and the athlete as well additionally with simple programming it doesn't involve any sort of prior testing or anything it's more flexible in terms of in the long-term athletic development because that way when sessions need to be changed um, due to injury due to fatigue due to um, other training sessions so if you're working in a team and you need to change something because the coach has changed their plan that's when simple comes a little bit easier because it works with you it works with the coach and then you take into consideration if you're working individually with an athlete both the in internal and external factors that can affect the athlete fatigue um, stress appetite for example if they had a shit day obviously you want to bring down the intensity um, furthermore simple heat programming programming can and i just previously mentioned that can work within a team environment where for example if the main aim of the training session and this is where you talk with the coach was to work on an sorry aerobic development you could set up a controlled environment using a passing passing drill or tactic where the players work from box to box with obstacles but in hindsight since this drill as an example is usually completed as a group by group you could have the additional groups doing a smaller pass pass and run drill while they wait their turn just to keep up that relative aerobic engagement during the rest interval so you've just given them a low intensity um, rest interval intensity but because they're not passively resting they're still doing some work this increases their time spent at vo2 max which is known to further improve or further encourage aerobic engagement so on the next slide it's just got examples for actually all five hit types which i've personally used so you can see on the table just straight away each hit type is broken down with each hit weapon and just the work to rest interval and then i've put in just some distances you can just use so hit um so hit type one is targeted by hit short interval and it's just done by a 10 on 10 off with a passive rest intensity after the set and I've only set the interval distance to about 20 minutes, which is pretty doable for most um, semi-professional teams. Hit, uh, hit type two, which is aerobic with, but with neuromuscular strain, is done with hit short again, but I've added in a change of direction component. So as an example, after every second rep, they would do a 180 change of direction and run back. That gets the neuromuscular um, strain that we need or would look for during this hit type two. But to kind of to sort of balance out that change of direction, I've increased the 
rest interval time in seconds. So it's now 10 to 20. Just because we know with neuromuscular strain, it's more fatiguing compared to a lot of other things. Hit type three, which is long interval. It's done for three minutes with two minutes off. And it's done on a sort of 400 meter lap as an example. So obviously being both anaerobic aerobic, you could just say you've got three minutes just to clear the 400 meter lap and whether they pace themselves properly or not, it's completely up to them. But because you're getting engagement both from both the aerobic and aerobic systems, that's mainly what you were looking for. Type four and type five becomes a little bit easier because you don't really have to set out distances. If you're using a soccer pitch, for example, with repeated sprint training, you can sort of start at the boundary line and tell them as it is, sprint for six seconds as far as you can. Once six seconds stops, rest on the spot for 24, six seconds to come back. And obviously over time, you'll find whenever they start from the boundary line, you'll see the distance which they get to on the field will become shorter and shorter and shorter over time. And that's just natural with the fatigue that's kicking in. And then hit type five, sprint interval, start them on one corner, use the longer boundary line and get them to sprint for 20 seconds flat out. And then two minutes rest. So there's just some simple examples for hip, hip programming. It's very straightforward and very sort of, it's pretty, pretty logical when you think about it. So we're back to this slide again, but let's talk about complex programming now. And I use the term complex just because it's a, a lot more to think about. So this is where I believe most coaches, especially new coaches or people who are looking into sort of conditioning can get confused with this concept as there is a lot to take in and then a lot to do. I would say sort of try to think of complex hit programming as something being completed in a perfect world, sort of the more elite sector would follow something very complex as well. That's what this is. With complex programming, there's usually some kind of testing done to help you give some, some base parameters. Testing can be done in a number of ways. For example, a 2K, 2K time trial, um, MAS testing, 3015 intermittent fitness testing, yo-yo level one or two, etc. There's a lot of tests you can use, but it's entirely up to you. You can use different tests for different environments. Like what would you use for a team versus what would you use for an individual? So what would be easier, an easier test to run as a team? And then what would be an easier test to run as an individual? What can you keep an eye on or what is easier to control in either of those environments? So that's something you can think about. Personally, for me, with in a team environment, I would say a yo-yo level two can be easier to control if you have a number of coaches assisting you. And then for an individual, we can do a 30-15 intermittent fitness test, but that can also be used in a team environment. As I said, completely up to you. But once you have collected the necessary parameters that you want to use, you can sort of think about the sport and the position your athlete plays in. Because as it is, what are the physiological demands for that athlete? So different sports have different demands, different positions have different demands. If we think of a goalkeeper, we think of short explosive bouts of jumping to save, getting up, quick movements. Whereas for a midfielder, they need that intermittent sort of activity where they may be chasing down a player, lose the ball, chase down that ball. They may be jogging upfield just to keep in line with the play. They may be making a defensive play. They may be making an attackive play. 
there's a whole bunch to think about when it comes to a bit more complex and how you can really nail it down to the individual or position specific. So as I brought up the mention of that testing and we think about it, where does this actually come into play? Again, it's up to you. There's a lot of flexibility in programming in the first place. Everyone is flexible. Everyone has different parameters with how they want to program. With the testing, it could be something that you want to improve after the first block of conditioning, or it can be something to sort of help preset your actual hit sessions. So using the 2K time trial, do you want to get faster and drop time for that? With the uh, yo-yo intermittent fitness test, do you want to get further or up, to, and, or up more stages? Or can this testing be actually used to sort of help guide your sessions? And this is where this slide comes into play. I know there's a lot of information right now, but I'm gonna break it down. So, same again, very similar concepts to simple program. So the first line, actually, sorry, before I get even get into the hit types, I've broken, I've used a 3015 intermittent or IFT test. I've gotten the score, which is that 15.5 in that bottom left-hand corner. Then using that score, I've broken it down into meters per second, which is 4.31 M slash S. This then allows me to create a formula to sort of help prescribe the hit types or hit methods that require distance. So we can see on the sort of bottom middle, the interval distance can be sort of used to based on what intensity you want. So I've got 4.31 times the, times the intensity, for example, I've put 90% divided by 100 times, times the time you want to set. So using the calculations, you can have a little bit of leniency in, what, in determining of what, what you want to hit. So where does this sort of example come into play? This example comes into play with hit type one, the hit short. So I've based it off the fact I've got 20 minutes in a given training session or given sports training, individual training, 20 minutes all up. Because hit type one is purely or predominantly, not purely, predominantly aerobic, we need to take into consideration that the O2 deficit phenomenon does occur. So there is a lag in oxygen before it starts getting utilized. So we can see on the notes, duration of the first set is actually set longer than the others to account for this inertia at the start of the session. So then, because I've got that note, I've then broken down the, rep, the sets and reps. So I've got three, I want three sets, but then I've broken it down into 18 and then 12 and 12. So you can see I've made up for that inertia at the very start. Then I've sort of wanted to get a bit closer to this, to this, this participant's 100% uh, VIFT intensity. So 90% of 15.5. Um, and then I've worked it out into a 10, 10, 10 on, 10 off passive recovery. But you can see because of the um, interval distance, it tells me they have to be clearing 35 meters every 10 seconds. So it sounds like it's intense stuff, which not wrong, it is. But that's the parameter that I said. I said, I want you to be working close to what you scored in the VIFT but you have to be clearing that at the same time. And then this sort of follows suit down the track with hit type two, 
and hit type three. Hit type three becomes a little bit more interesting because they actually have a set interval distance of 650 meters. So if you want to break that down, you can actually set out cones of where they have to hit during certain time periods. So because it's three minutes of work, every, every 45 seconds they have to be hitting a set distance. And that's how you can sort of create some kind of pacing strategy. You don't want it to be, you don't want it to be too fast where they can make the first one to two but then slowly start the gas out towards the end of that set, of that rep, sorry. Um, hit types four and five usually are very consistent in both simple and complex, just because of the all out nature that there are. But this sort of gives an insight of how complex hit programming can actually take into consideration a lot of other things and create a lot of different training situations or environment. Anybody can sort of run for three minutes at a good pace if it's controlled. I've got, I've, I'm, I'm going to present data that I've actually got to sort of demonstrate that. Um, Hit short probably sounds and looks bloody hard, but it's just short repeated, short repeated intervals. Funnily enough, do players do this in a game? Yes. Do you want to increase their ability to, to repeat it? Yes. Do you want them to not get gassed out? Yes. Hence why you do that sort of that kind of intensity. Um, just on the bottom right for clarification, you can also use a 2K time trial to get a meters per second score as well, which then you can actually use to sort of create an interval distance. That's just another calculation, um, which I can explain if anybody wants that, but you can use other methods to get um, meters per second rather than just one. And yeah, so just to finish off, um, this is the last slide where this is my this is my actual data from four, di four different athletes. One was a marathon runner, one was a VFL player, and the others played were state two, state one soccer soccer players. So immediately, you can see. The distance is varied. The distance uh, meters per minute is varied. The different um, percentages or different times players spent at different speed zones. You can see it's all varied, but when we get to session RPE, you can sort of see it's a little, little bit different. Hit type three being the easiest out of the bunch. No surprise there. Hit type one, hit type five being the hardest of the two. Once again, Bit of a no surprise there. Just due to the parameters I set and I wanted to look at for both of those sessions, I expected it to be hard. And I told him it's going to be hard, without a doubt. But it's just sort of interesting to see where even though we've hit type one, even though that's supposed to be short repeated uh, intervals, None of the players made it above 25.2, which is surprising, considering they had to keep making that set distance every 10 seconds. Whereas for a repeated sprint and sprint interval, you sort of expect that. Expect that um, speed to be up there. What I also just find pretty interesting is that most of these guys were able to maintain, as you can see for hit type three, above 14.4 for three minutes with, it, with ease. So what does that tell me immediately? You guys are fine when it's long continuous distance. There's no doubt that any player who plays a sport can do this. 
they may have done it for years and just been, if you think about coaches and the old coaching way, run until the sun goes down, of course, they're going to be good at that. It's when it comes down to the actual breaking it up into intervals or into minute type exercise it is when it becomes interesting. Um, that hit one was actually the most shocking session I've seen. It was just shocking. Like, it's your, not your duty as an athlete, but it's your position as an athlete to be able to keep up with the speed of play, to be able to keep making these points of play, these movements repeatedly. Why is it so hard for you guys? But that's something they've worked on. And I've speaking to one of the athletes who actually goes to Deacon and I taught him, he said he kept doing the trials because they gave him the, the, uh, the actual, I gave him this, so the, the actual program. And he found when he went back to playing for his team, he was a lot better in terms of game, small-sided games, game-based situations, tactics. Just all that felt better. But, um, yeah, that's it for me. Um, that is pretty much what I've explored for a full year. Contrary, this is actually still going on. Hopefully when we're allowed to do some testing outside, I'm going to still keep doing this. But, yeah, um, any questions, have to shoot away. If anybody wants anything or wants to wants further discussion, please let me know. I've, Got a whole bunch of different stuff about this. Question? Yeah. I know most of the stuff you would do in straight lines or one potential change of direction. Do you yep. find ways um, or did you look at ways to in incorporate any of these types with uh, some... I, like, like curved learning? Yeah, like yeah. Curve less control curve. type stuff, yeah. Um, you curve. can do that. Yeah. Yeah, we found, um, well, mainly during the sprint type so type yeah, five yeah, yeah. They had, they, we had to curve players okay um but you can actually and if you have the availability to use a whole soccer pitch you can actually set up diagonally from one corner to another corner and add in a curve within there yeah so you can do that um but obviously if you're using measurable data it's going to change up considerably but because sports not played linear yeah. You do want to implement that. I've been looking, I've implemented that a couple of yeah. times. And do you have like any data on like the aerospace? Cause I know with the, when you do some sort of MAS, you take off like you add, take off two meters or three meters, two meters, three meters for that change of direction, that turn. Yeah. So, time. okay. Um, yeah. So if we, so yeah. One change of direction there. Yeah. Yeah. So we took off, similar... we took off three meters because okay. it was a 180. Yep. So it was a complete 180. So we took off three meters. Even. So we divided it by half and then took off three meters either way. Okay. Um, funnily enough, if you do, I think it's mainly for the more angle change of direction. So that more like 180 yep. the, uh, and 90 degree is where you want to look at taking off some meters. But if it's 45 or around that sort really of more, less, yeah. you know, it, it wouldn't be less. It would just be very minimal. I would say even less than half to one meter okay. to make up for that compensation. Makes sense. Because they're not decelerating as hard as a 180 to a 90. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah. That's my question. Sweet. Hey, Matt, I got a question for you, mate. Yeah. What's up? Um, just if you go back to the your data, yep. Um, hit type three. So is that the long interval one? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So like it's interesting how your max heart rate is actually the highest as well as for average. Why do you think yeah. that is? Um, I think during sometimes where environments did take into consideration because we were testing mid spring so there were days where it was 28 to high 30s for those and 
I know some players weren't really adjusted to pacing as well. So they would have sped up, slowed down because I was still there with them, pretty much yelling at them, saying, you need, you need to speed up towards the end. So pretty much forcible exertion would have increased their heart rate there. Awesome, mate. Thanks. All right. Any other questions? I'm happy to talk about anything. I'll go another one. Um, what was your choice yep. of speed zones? I asked this a couple of weeks ago as well. Um, well, it did vary. We were looking more towards... We're not, we weren't really looking at speed zones itself. Yeah, it's just kind of it, categorize those three, like fourteen point four, nineteen eight, and then. Well, that's what the GPS gave us. Okay, so based off, they were catapult ones. Well, they yes, yeah, cat old but old style catapult. Yeah, ones. yeah, okay. But yeah, they gave us those. But I think, I think it was within more data, which is mm -hmm. because we based this off something else, but I won't get into that. Mm -hmm. Um. This this other person. So we worked with Martin Boucher. Yep. He broke it down into this. That's well. it. Okay. So I think there there he selected speed zones. So I didn't have control of the speed zones. It was just the way it is. But yep. I believe I'd actually follow very similar to this because it does yeah. break it down into twenty five. Twenty five is pretty quick, but it's not like yeah, max it, max exertion types. Yeah, stuff. which is good because it. Breaks it down from that. You can see, see 14.4 to 19.8 gives that massive leeway of yeah. what some players are able to do and what other players can't do, which I think is a pretty handy. Yeah, definitely. Matty, I've got another question. Yeah, mate. Um, so, if you're like the Kingston boys, um, what strategies do you kind of use um, to plan your hit sessions for, like, say, throughout the week? Do you look at kind of like what you theme your hit based on kind of the theme of the session? So do you guys like use like a tactical periodization or anything like that? So I, I would first have a pre-plan and sort of base it around, do we have a game? Do we have a season game or an FFA cup or do we have both? Because that is actually realistic where you can have two games in one week. Once I find that out, I then go... All right, so our games would be played on Saturdays. Our training was Thursday, Wednesday, Monday. I then break it down into what do I want to achieve in those three sessions and what do I have to take into account for? So obviously with the back-to-back -back training sessions on Wednesday, Thursday, if I do something that's higher speed, they're going to be fucked for Thursday. And I don't want to do anything else because it, they might be fucked for, uh, for the game. So from there, I break it into, okay, so do I want to do something more fast paced, but not maximal on Thursday to get them neurologically prepared? Or do I want to get higher speed done at the start of the week? Once I have some sort of pre-plan, I then actually... I've always messaged the coaches and go, what's your plan for the week? And if they go, if they go from a day by day basis, which has happened, or if I'm lucky enough, it's, they give me a week, the whole week. I then organize the hit sessions or manipulate them to fit what they want to do tactically. So that's where that flexibility comes in as well. Cheers, man. Thanks. No Easy. Uh, hey, Matt. Great presentation. Really enjoyed you. um, what you've put forward. Uh, really like the simplified method that you've used to distill the different adaptations you want and the and the different prescriptions you use and methodologies. Um, I had a question on essentially worse, you know, game worst case scenarios in terms yeah. of the periods of a game where there's maximal loadings that um, are the, the worst case scenarios throughout the game. How do you go about 
identifying those, uh, prescribing for those? Do you prescribe for them specifically? Do you do that kind of stuff or what, what's your um, approach from that perspective? So with, unfortunately with the season being shut, we didn't get a chance to sort of go into depth because we were getting GPS units for Kingston, but yeah. that went out the window. So I couldn't really properly identify different players' um, speed zones or the actual max speeds or the t- periods of time they spent at different speed zones. Mm-hmm. But if I was to get that and see some players were absolutely just spent most of the time between, let's, let's use the 19.8 and 25.2 speed zones and very low at the 14.4, I would look at them after the match, tell them, hey, you need to have a day rest. And if they're still feeling a bit fatigued for that training, I'll just dial them back a bit more. So whether it be dropping by a, cup, by a bit of percentage or dropping them into a lower training group, if you break down your groups into like different stuff like that, or tell them like you need to sort of rest a bit more. Because it could be depending on the game situation. It could be they are just going at the ball. They could be um, just stimulus, uh, stimulized to the point where they've just got a aggression going. They like just need to keep chasing the ball. It all depends on what's happened during the game. And then from there, I make adjustments if I could see the data. Yeah. Okay. And do you do any profiling of athletes? Do you identify the guys are really explosive, really fast, really fast twitch and kind of yeah. maybe adjust your prescriptions for those guys? And conversely, the guys at the other end that aren't, you know, fast twitch, they're not going to tolerate high speeds well. Do you adjust your programming? Yeah, for sure. Um, based on for that? Sure. For sure. Um, even during this um, this data ops on up on the screen, the marathon runner did struggle with the change of direction. So instantly I had to sort of manipulate that. But yeah, you wouldn't take into account the guys who can clear time trials, a 2K time trial quickly compared to guys who cannot. Um, and it would be something to sort of just sit down with them and sort of talk one-on-one and say, hey, you're really good at doing long-distance stuff over periods of time. However, we may need to work on this, especially for a game sense. If they can keep running and have an engine and keep that engine going for the whole game, but can then add in that bouts of explosive or high-explosive activity, they're good as gold. Thanks very much, Matt. No worries. Uh, I've got a quick question. Um, yeah. When would you go about implementing your different types of hit training, like in, in terms of what part of the preseason? And would you ever give the guys a session where they can just go and do it in their own time on a weekend? As you said, some of this is quite simple to follow, which is good. Um, do you think that you can give the athletes the um, independence and go, complete this throughout the week, this is what you specifically have to do? Yeah, for sure. Um, Of course, it's a learning curve. But once you break it down and talk about it within training, you can definitely say to them, like, here, this is what we're going to do for the week. If you feel like you need to do a top-up or just tick the legs over, here's something else you can also do. Um, That's in a team sport environment. If you're working individually, you can actually make it a little bit more easier for them where you can be there for one session, one to two sessions, and they can do the other two to three or however more they want to do by themselves. So you can definitely do that. Um, And the first part to answer within different uh, seasons, so pre-season, off-season, in-season, definitely, and it just depends. I would like to look at some kind of testing parameters first i would like to do some kind of test just to see where not as a team sorry as a team and individually i want to see where everyone is i want to see what's the average of every position on and then i want to see how they are as a single player 
And then from there, what I could sort of do is then plan the training sessions along with the coaches to keep these players into sort of groups. Won't say anything to them, but these players are grouped together. So the high, if you use a yo-yo test and you have people clearing stage 17 and above, keep them together. 12 to 16, keep them together. Less than 12, keep them together. And that way with the sort of hit session, it's for that group. So you're aiming to improve the parameters you've seen as that sort of group average. And then you can also tweak it a bit for the individuals in that group. So you can have one group doing a 45 degree change of direction, but they're clearing a quarter of the pitch. You can have another group just going straight line, um, straight line for 15 seconds. So you can have that all that different change there. Do you say that if you're doing multiple sets, do you see the need to do them one after the other or can you drip feed them throughout their session? Um, sorry. Can have, you have, you, have you explored that yet or is it, is it something that you think about exploring further or do you think um, there's a, a most effective way? I guess it, I, I haven't really explored it, but from what I understand is that if you were to, if you, you only had like, a 10 minute block and then it was 10 minutes of your time tactical 10 minutes um i would say you can keep it as a split set like that it is more beneficial to complete it at once but obviously in the real world you're not going to get that with the coach sometimes but if you can do split sets you would sort of have to manipulate that second set depending on what they just did. So if they did a small-sided game and you're looking at doing hit type three, which is aerobic and anaerobic, um, you would have to manipulate what weapon or method you are using because you could have the idea, oh, I want to do a bit of a longer interval, but wait, because of the small-sided game, they might be completely sort of depleted. So I might change the method to something else. Or you might manipulate the work intensity. It, it, it just depends. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a really important thing to consider because I guess as a lot of people here could attest to as well, being in the SNC field and as well being athletes, sometimes you go to training and you do something like small-sided games or some match sim and then all of a sudden they're asking you to do high intensity interval training at your max speed, effort after effort, and then guess what? You've got another set after a three, four minute break. When I, when I hear that, I'm just going, oh, my body cannot handle this at all. Yeah. Um, so and I'm sure most of the people in here have experienced the same throughout their training. Yeah, I think um, what, what has happened before we got closed down was what was the I would take the warm up they would do sort of a long distance interval and then they do sort of game tactics and then I'll get told as they're doing the game tactics I'll get them to do sprints and I'm just like no that's not happening so I bring the boys over and like all right we're just going to tick over we're just going to drop it down I'll call out anywhere between 40 to 60 percent and that's all we're doing. So I do look. You do when that if that happens, or the coach says to you, you will have to sort of explain to them, or worse, just go against them. Yeah. Because you don't want to overkill the players, which keeps happening to this day, which is shit. I'll just say, Joe, like this, with me, I definitely plan my conditioning around my small sided games. Um, so like I actually aim to get that adaptation through the small side of game rather than the conditioning. So yeah. I just use like my conditioning hit sets to complement whatever the small side of games are. Um, like I'm, it, it's exactly what Maddie said though. Like it depends on your planning and organization. Um, thankfully to me, like every, all our coaches are pretty anal and we've planned the session to a T for, for like beforehand. 
Um, so it's a lot easier when you do prescribe kind of like conditioning and stuff from that, but 100% you would need to factor in the type of small side of games that you're doing. And like that's why I asked before, we kind of, we theme our sessions based on tactical. So we use like a tactical periodization. So we know if we're doing like attacking transition, it's going to be pretty high intense um, sprint kind of intervals. So I'll, I'll factor in the type of conditioning I'll be doing in that sense. But the last thing yeah. you want is a, a group of boys pretty much telling you to go get fucked. We're not doing sprints after doing five sets of small sided games because um, you'll lose your body straight away. Oh, 100%. I've, I've been there myself playing AFL football just in local comps the last few years and, and using it as an opportunity to step back and not be the S&C guy and actually just enjoy my footy. And we'll do a match sim game for 10 or a drill for 10 minutes and then they go, all right, we've got 2050s and I'm done. I don't want to do fucking 2050s after I <laughs> bust my ass for 10 minutes. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's too much. I think soccer's a little bit ahead of local footy. Um, so uh, yeah, it's just cool. to also follow on Joey's point with the small side of games, you can actually, and it depends on the small side of game, you can actually manipulate um, anything else. So if you have an interchange where players are swapping in and out every couple of minutes, you can actually get them doing stuff on the side, whether it be with the ball or just getting, just doing like a low intensity, something small. That way you can still sort of get that adaptation without having to flog them afterwards or do external conditioning sessions. You can actually manipulate it with the small side of game. Yeah, yeah no, I totally agree. I'll just add, just because like I've had the luxury of knowing exactly what kind of um, output numbers I get from small sided games because we've had like three or four years of GPS. Um, so like I actually know the meters per minute and stuff like that. That's why I can tie in exactly what I'm doing with my conditioning. Yeah. If you don't if you don't have that, you're literally guessing, which is just yeah. gonna be too hard. You're gonna be throwing shit on the wall and hoping hoping it sticks. But. Yeah, that's very much unfortunate. Yeah, that's why that's why I said it's unfortunate because we were both myself and the assistant coach and the accountant were talking about units for this year. So, yeah, I wish I had access to them for the entire year, which I'm hoping I will have access next year. But if not, I'm just going to take the ones from uni. 